Hi, everyone. I'm Marco Shero. I am a young adult and middle grade author. Uh, I'm known uh, primarily for my uh, YA debut, uh, which came out in May 2018. It is called Anger is a Gift. Uh, I have another novel coming out in September 2020 called Each of Us a Desert, which is a YA fantasy. And I have my middle grade debut coming out in the fall of 2021 called The Insiders. Uh, I, this video, uh, first of all, um, is made in partnership with Words Alive, an organization connecting children, teens, and families to the power of reading. Uh, I happen to have a wonderful relationship with Words Alive, which is based in San Diego, because in the winter of 2018, they helped us facilitate bringing me back out to California um, and doing one of my favorite school visits that I've ever done um, in downtown San Diego as well. And I got to meet a bunch of kids who normally don't get to meet people like me, who don't get to uh, see that um, uh, people like myself get to be authors and get to be creative and can actually make a career out of it. Uh, I had an incredible time. And if I remember correctly, there was actually a young uh Latino kid who came up to me afterwards who, uh, oh, I actually, I definitely remember this correctly, who um, more or less told me that they now believed it was possible for them to write. So I'm not going to cry at the beginning of this lesson. Um, anyway, uh, the organization serves over 5,500 participants, um, and they reach readers through their Read Aloud program, their teen services, uh, their family uh, literacy, literacy programs. So you can learn more about them and donate them to help them uh, through this pandemic as you know, it has affected all of us. Um, if you go to wordsalive.org, please go, even if you're just coming for the lesson. So that is the point of this video, actually. Uh, I'm using this wonderful Google uh, Hangout technology in order to record a writing lesson. And this is a workshop that I have given uh, in multiple places. And part of the reason for uh, doing this um, is that growing up, I was never taught how to write stories. It, it was most, most of what I've taught was functional things in terms of like, here is a five part essay, you know, introduction, three points and they're supporting, you know, information and then you have your conclusion or whatnot. And even when I was assigned creative writing, I almost never learned what a process is and what a writer's process is to bring that initial idea into its final form, whether that's a screenplay, whether it's a short story, whether it's a novel, all of that stuff I had to figure out mostly through trial and error, <laughs> lots and lots of error. Uh, I wrote my first book at 20. Um, it did not see the light of day for many years. It actually will get there because it's part of how that idea gets formed into something bigger. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So the point of this lesson turning an idea into a story is to help you, whoever you happen to be, um, learn what your process is. Because I want to give this whole lecture one giant caveat at the beginning. And the caveat is what works for me is not going to work for you. And what works for me does not work the same for any of my author friends. We all sort of have figured out what our own process is. And what I mean by that is, what are the things, the actual things you do when you get that first idea, what do you then do with that idea? Um, part of what this is, is also developing the idea that you can pre-write. Um, and what pre-writing is, is you do things, creative things with writing before you actually write a single word of your short story or your manuscript, your novel, whatever it is. Um, and I do that with everything. So this lecture is lecture workshop. Uh, it's more of a workshop when we're in person because I have little pauses normally built in where I'm like, okay, give me an idea and we build it out. But it's a little harder to do that over digital. So it's more of a lecture right now. Um, so the way that this is going to work is we're, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to share my screen in a little bit and use a PowerPoint presentation that has um, things written down. Um, you can use that to take notes or whatnot. Uh, I am going to go through things that I do that are part of my process to turn an idea into a story. There are also things in here that I will never use that are forms of pre-writing that ha do nothing for me. But I want to give them to you because that might be the thing that unlocks the story. Um, and so all of this is my big way of saying the caveat is, is you're going to figure out your own way. Hopefully this inspires you and gives you information that you did not have. But I don't want you to be concerned that you're not doing it exactly like Marco Shiro does it. You don't do it exactly like this author does it. Everyone's is different. So um, 
let's get started first. Uh, I'm going to do present now. We're going to choose a window. We are going to do turn an idea into a story. We are going to press play on this. So, all right. Um, I, I did a test run of this, and it's really weird because on my end, all I see is the PowerPoint, but I realize in the video, my little face is like off to the side, so you can still see me. So anyway, turning an idea into a story by me from here, my apartment here in Brooklyn where it's sunny but cold, and I'm very mad because it's April and it should be warm. Anyway, so let's start just as a more general idea too because I want to sort of normalize the idea that ideas, where do ideas come from? Literally anywhere. And there's a lot of shame sometimes I hear from uh, young writers about where they got their idea. Um, it kind of doesn't really matter where it comes from. Um, whatever sparks that initial burst of creativity, that's great, take it and run. So let's talk about some places ideas come from. Um, everyday life, and this seems kind of obvious, but things like interactions with friends and family members, um, conversations that you have that might spark uh, ideas. Uh, this happens a lot with a lot of us who are writers. Uh, we have friends who are writers and we will bounce ideas off one another. And this just happened. Um, I am in a anthology. Um, uh, my friend Zoraida Cordova asked me to be in a, a Latinx science fiction and fantasy anthology. And I said yes before I had an actual idea. And then I pitched the vaguest idea. I was like, all of my ideas right now and I'm gonna show you my ideas, or not literally show them to you, but show you where they are. All of them are contemporary ones. And so I was like, I don't really have a science fiction or a fantasy one. Well, I have this one idea, and I'm not gonna say it now because it's my idea and I don't want you to take it, because uh, <laughs> it's really good. And as we started talking, I was like, oh my God, there's actually way more here than I thought there was gonna be. Oh, this is really great. So sometimes just having a conversation about even the slightest idea of an idea can make it become a fuller one. Um, from your job, from school, from common anxiety. Um, an example of this, I have a short story coming out. I believe the anthology is, oh, I should have looked this up before I started this. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, there's a sequel to All Out. Uh, I believe it is called All Out Now. Uh, wow, if I got that title wrong. Anyway, it is uh, edited by Sandra Mitchell. It is a sequel to All Out, uh, except ours are all uh, contemporary stories. And so I wrote a short story based on a really, really bad blind date uh, that I went on when I was 19 years old, except I took what really happened to me, something that is an everyday occurrence for some people. Uh, hopefully you're not going on blind dates every single day. Don't go on blind dates, actually. It's really bad. Anyway, I took that and wrote pretty much what happened, but then twisted it into another fantastic realm. I mean, it's still contemporary story, but I just imagined a different way that the story would have gone um, or my life would have gone. Uh, so you can that's you can take from your everyday life in order to create a story. Um, older projects and ideas. So here is a piece of advice if you are a creator. And this is not just writing, but if you do anything, art, if you do, um, you know, like physical art, me, uh, those, that specific medium, if you are a musician, if you are po anything, it doesn't matter. Don't throw away the stuff that you create ever. Don't delete it. You could put it in a folder so you don't have to look at it anymore. But I save all my older projects and ideas, even things where I have gone through this pre-writing process. I get to writing the story and I'm like, oh, this is still not a thing. I don't really like it. So dig out those old stories, poems, and trunked novels uh, or stories. Uh, the trunked means that you just put it away in a trunk. You're not looking at it. Um, not literally. I don't have a trunk here where I have old writing, but on my computer, I do have a folder that is called trunk. And in that is all the stuff that I'm like, I don't really need to read this anymore. Or it is like old edited versions of things. Um, and I keep everything. Here is why. Time is often the feedback that you need. New experiences, new outlooks, and a new understanding of your own writing process. All of those things can help you realize why a story was not working for. So I'm gonna go back to what I had mentioned earlier. Uh, I wrote my first novel when I was 20 years old. I didn't really tell anyone about it. Uh, and the reason I didn't tell anyone about it because I wasn't sure it was really good. Uh, I also didn't really know what I was doing. I had some training as a writer, but not that much. And it was mostly in journalism. And I wrote what I thought was a really cute story, young adult story uh, about a kid who discovers a portal in his closet to a magical realm. Uh, <laughs> that is not a subtle metaphor at all. Um, and that actual idea 
uh, 15 years later, split off into two different projects. And from that, I went back and revisited it a, uh, about a year and a half ago and was like, oh, this writing's not very good. Also, I went about it very strangely and thought if you sent your manuscript to agents and editors at the same time, your odds were better. Uh, that, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, that young adult novel, the thing that it took me is after spending 15 years running a book blog, being involved in young adult science fiction and middle grade, I realized that this young adult idea that I had was actually a middle grade book and that the character needed to be younger. And from that idea, I actually split off and created two things. One, which is The Insiders, my middle grade debut, um, where a kid discovers a magical uh, janitor's closet on his school campus. But then the portal element of it, I took off and created a whole other middle grade project that I hope gets published someday. So sometimes time is really all that you need. Um, dreams, actually, this is a very common one that I hear a lot is people just like, oh, I had a dream, some weird stuff was in it. I wrote it down. The truth is that this, your subconscious is a powerful idea generator. It is great for the surreal and the strange. Um, for example, uh, my second young adult book, Each of Us a Desert, that is out um, in September 15th, 2020, um, contains a very strange form of magic in which people's nightmares, the things that they keep to themselves that are bad, can become real. And that idea of that happening came from a nightmare that I had a few years ago. And I had written it down as an idea for a story, and it actually became a part of this. I'm going to get more into writing down ideas in a second. Um, reactions to the world. And this is sort of related to everyday life as well. So many writers create stories as ways of processing the world around them. Social allegories, metaphors, or an attempt to grapple with oppression or injustice are all forms of this. This is truthfully probably the most uh, common form of an idea generator for me is that, um, and I'm gonna uh, bring up my friend, Danielle Clayton, who is the author of The Bells and the Tiny Pretty Thing series of Sona Chirapatra. Uh, and I bring that bring her up because she often talks about how her inspiration for her work is when she is angry or upset or experiences conflict around something and she's working out her feelings towards it and why she feels so angry. And those sort of grain of an idea becomes a greater idea. Um, I would say almost every piece of fiction that I've written, uh, which is at this point three, nov three novels, more short stories than I can count. Almost all of them are reactions to something in the real world. Anger is a gift is a reaction to being on the uh, receiving end of police brutality. It's a reaction to being um, a losing a uh, father. It's um, a great deal of it is actually autobiographical. I just twisted it to fit this fictional narrative. Is fantastical as my next YA book is. There's a lot of that that is very, very personal and is my way of reacting to the world. You can actually absolutely mine your own life um, in order to create stories. So wherever these ideas come from, what do you do with them? You have an idea, it pops in your head. Either you wake up, some, you're in the shower, that happens all the time. Uh, <laughs> especially lately, you know, I, I've been taking more showers than I have in my entire life. And I, uh, all my friends know, hygiene, top of the list. Like I was already like, constant showers all the time. Um, but like anytime I go outside during this quarantine and I come back in, I mean, I take a shower uh, and then I dissociate in the shower and I just kind of sit there and just enjoy the heat of the water. And a lot of times that's where just my subconscious or my conscious mind pops out an idea or I work out something. Um, I get ideas when I go on runs. I get ideas when I'm listening to music, when I'm playing video games, they just pop into my head. What happens when you get an idea, whatever it happens to be. Um, and let me just say, before I go to this next slide, there is no such thing as a bad idea. There it can be bad execution of an idea, or an idea could not actually lead to a full story. But I like to say that just at the idea phase, anything is game. It's what you do after with that idea that matters more. So what do you do with these ideas? Write them down. Write them down, write them down. Have you written them down yet? So what I mean by write them down, two things. One, um, actually I'll go to the next, the next slide. So keep a physical notebook. Here's my physical notebook of ideas. I'm not gonna open it because I don't want you to, someone will pause this video and then 
read my okay you're not gonna see it anyway um or whatever works best for you and can be cl kept close to you this is right here on my desk so if i do happen to wake up and i want to actually write it down i can do that um make sure to back it up with a digital version scans or photos with a cell phone in case of damage or loss i have another notebook which is oh it's in the living room i'm not gonna go get it um I gotta give a shout out to my friend Jason Reynolds, uh, an incredible writer and uh, author and human being uh, who I enjoy so much and respect so much. And uh, Moleskin makes a notebook. And if you can afford the investment, because it's a very expensive Moleskin notebook, actually, the pen is the more expensive part. Um, when I, I use this notebook specifically uh, for longer ideas, when I'm with free writing, and we're gonna talk about what free writing is in a second, longer ideas, I use. To, used to use it mostly on the subway. <laughs> oh my God. I miss the MTA, everyone. Uh, I can't believe I said that out loud. Uh, yeah, and uh, what's neat about it is the pen has a little camera on it. So as you write it, it saves all of it. You can hook it up via USB um, to a computer. Uh, it syncs everything with an, with an app. And so it saves all your notes. You don't have to do that. I would just say scan it or take photos with your cell phone in case of damage or in case you lose it. The other thing I would recommend is use technology that backs up to the clouds. Um, you can use the Notes app on iPhone, for example. Um, that's my baby Yoda. So what I do is I have um, up at the top of my Notes app, and I'm what, just going to flash a little bit, uh, story and book ideas. Uh, and uh, I have right now um, not actually that many ideas I haven't done anything with because now as I'm looking through this, about three or four of these have actually turned into something. Um, so I have this so that if I'm somewhere and I get an idea, I can just quickly write something down. Um, <laughs> yeah, please write that shit down. Please, please write it down. Here's the other thing. Don't just write down the idea. I'm going to give you an example. There is one poorly written idea on here and the reason i say it's poorly written is i just wrote magical gay bar i'm sure i was out here in new york city when i could go out and i wrote that down and thought it was a cool idea and i would get back to it later i have been have thus been unable to figure out what that idea actually was write all of it down every part of the idea that you think about i now ever since that because that thing is that idea has played what was my idea i know it was good um i write down where i was i write the date i try to include physical details like you were in this bar you were talking to this person whatever any of that stuff because i want as much of that information and that initial inspiration to be there so that when i come back to it later i actually know what i was talking about so um let's get to the real meat of this lecture what do you do with an idea and this is what a lot of young writers struggle with i have this idea i don't actually know how to write a story um, I have written many stories at this point. I can't tell you definitively that I'm an expert at writing a story, but I think I'm pretty good at it. But it took me years to figure out what my process was to take an idea and turn it into something. So uh, what do you do with an idea? First of all, whatever you want. Embrace the creative freedom of an idea. Don't get bogged down in the notion that there is only one way to write a short story or one way to write a novel, or that an idea has to be a novel or it has to be a short story. Go with what feels right. Um, this is all about discovering your process. Try all sorts of things. As I go through these techniques, give yourself the freedom to create um, and the freedom of having fun with it. And I mean that too, because sometimes this can feel like such a weighty career and such a weird thing to do, but I still try to have fun as much as possible. So what are some methods of developing ideas into stories? We are first gonna start with this concept, which is free writing. This is when you take your idea and just start writing. No expectations, no rules, no framework, just write. And I don't mean write the story, just write whatever you happen to want. This is actually my first step. I get an idea and when I think, okay, this is an idea that I wanna develop into something. Uh, I do this, this second thing, right, or the second bullet point here. Uh, I write to myself. I tell myself what sort of story I want out of that idea. And I literally write to myself. Okay, like, and imagine this is a transcript. Okay, Mark, you have this idea of a magical gay bar. That seems cool. What is the conflict? What What is interesting about it? What about it makes it magical? That's what I'm actually typing or writing by hand. And I just start talking through it. 
Uh, often that is what uh, is replacing talking through an idea with another person. Um, I, I find that that is what helps build out an idea is to have a conversation about it. Um, there are other forms of free writing. I don't do them, but I know people who do. For example, some people just write as a character. If your idea is a person rather than a story idea, which is completely valid, sometimes they will write as that character and just start interacting with the world, or maybe they write a monologue from that character, but you just do it. I say write with the freedom of knowing that no one unless you're me and you're about to share some of this work in this lecture, no one will read this stuff. Because honestly, that's hard, right? It's one of the hardest parts about being a creative person. This thing that I'm creating, eventually someone else has to read it, right? I'm gonna, even if you're writing, if you're, oh God, especially if you're writing fan fiction, if you're writing uh, short stories for Scribd, if you're putting your work anywhere outside of your computer, another human being is gonna read it. Just terrifying, right? completely mortifying. I've written three novels at this point. So it's still, uh, uh, how about not? How about no one reads it? But that's what I take away from the experience of free writing and doing stuff before I write a story is I'm like, no one's going to read this so I can write whatever I want. It can be as bad as I want it to be. I don't care. Um, so here's another one. And this one I've only used once. And I used this once and it was for Anger is a Gift when it actually had a different title and it was a different plot. We're gonna get into this specifically. So this is called the snowflake method. It was created by novelist and theoretical physicist, Randy Ingermanson. Uh, this is a very, very specific means of turning an idea into a story. So uh, basically how this work is one idea is further complicated over and over as are all of the preliminary characters that you think of until the story is as complex as the snowflakes. So start with a one sentence summary of a novel a big picture overview of a novel. Um, and I would say the snowflake method mostly works only for novels. You can do it for short stories and I know people who do. Um, I just find that the snowflake method worked really well for the idea of a novel because it helped me figure out subplots and what were themes and motifs that I wanted to weave in through the story. So you start with a one sentence summary. Um, a person discovered, so this is where we would have like a back and forth if this was in a classroom. So I'd ask something in one sentence summary. So uh, we'll do the magical gay bar. Uh, expand that sentence to a paragraph. So if I came up with a, um, a college age student discovers a magical gay bar on a lonely night out. That's not a bad idea actually. <sighs> Hold that thought. Anyway, then you take that and you expand that sentence to a paragraph four to five sentences, maybe more, and do the summary of the whole entire book in just one paragraph, which is also good practice for pitching your book. You should be able to pitch your book very shortly. Um, by this point, if you've now expanded uh, that sentence to a paragraph, um, you take that paragraph and you write a whole page. You take it and you build out multiple plots that you think might work or whatnot. Um, None of this you are bound to. You can use it, you can throw it away, it doesn't matter, or not throw it away, but put it somewhere, save it, please, um, or whatnot. So then I hope by that point you went gone from a sentence to a paragraph to a page. I hope you've mentioned a character. Doesn't have to be a human, doesn't have to be people, it can be whatever. Hopefully you've mentioned characters. So do the same for each of the characters who take part in that story. So each sentence to a paragraph, each paragraph to a page about the plot, about each of the characters. You can do it with plots specifically. You can do it with locations. Any of the things that you do, the idea is you just keep building it out and building it out and building it out. So here is a great example. This is actually the snowflake method that I wrote for Anger is a Gift when it used to be called uh, the uh, An Insidious Thing was the title that I came up for. And it used to also be... Uh, <laughs> Oh, this is so weird to read. Um, it also used to be a science fiction dystopian trilogy or start of what I thought was a trilogy. So I came up with, here we go, one sentence summary of what I thought this book was going to be. Two teenagers inspire their community to fight against the weaponization of their schools, which is actually still kind of what Anger is a Gift is about. It's not two teenagers anymore. Um, this is also when Moss's best friend was named Lee. And then I was like, no, it, she has to be named Esperanza because uh, the House of Mega Sheets is my favorite book. So anyway, so then I took that to one uh, one paragraph summary. 
Moss and Lee are annoyed when the train home is delayed one night, but are horrified to discover an acquaintance of theirs has spontaneously combusted. This was a weird book. When they discover, when they soon discover a link between this and new safety measures being enacted at their school, they set out to organize a community effort to reject attempts to weaponize the school. Um, yeah, as you can see, if you've read Anger is a Gift, there are things here that are still the same. There are things that are very, very different. And then I took the characters, uh, Morris Moss Jeffries, things that he wanted to do. Uh, it's interesting because in the original versions, his mother was not as supportive. I wanted there to be pushback. Um, and uh, that became a different plot. So you can see that this is how I sort of took an idea and then just kept growing it and growing it. So another way you can do some pre-writing uh, is through character profiles. So first, as I mentioned before, some uh, writers, they discover their story through characters, not the plot. I am a plot person. I think of plots first and characters second. Um, but you may not do that. So this is a bunch of stuff that I don't do, but can be very, very helpful if this works for you. So as I mentioned before, you can free write as the character. You can free write about characters. Uh, and so an example is I have a friend who writes biographies of all the characters first as if they are real people like a very dry historical biography. And for them, they want to figure out the details of their life up to that point. Um, and in the finding out those details, that's how they find, oh, well, I bet they have an interesting thing that would conflict with this part of their past. Oh my, and that's how they think of story, is they think of a person. Um, I'll give a great uh, uh, example. Uh, do I have his book? I do have his book over here. Um, so uh, this is an adult novel. It is probably my favorite novel of the year. It's called Real Life by uh, Brandon Taylor. Brandon Taylor says that he figures out what a character is wearing and it's through their clothes that he determines their story. And that's, the, my, my brain was like, oh, that's so brilliant. That's so smart because what a person is wearing says so much about them. For example, I'm wearing this incredibly chaotic shirt that has made so many people angry and I've only worn it outside once because I, I got it like right before the quarantine. It says Neon Genesis Evangelion, but it's in the Garfield logo. Great. This says a lot about me. Oh boy. So uh, I think that's super fascinating. Um, I know people who can do this, but they draw art of their characters or they paint their characters. Yo, I can't paint, draw, or any of those things, but if that works for you, go for it. Um, other people stick characters into a scene and write how they would react. Uh, I, I notice a lot of this is usually uh, born out of fan fiction prompts. And I, I will say, all of this still applies to fan fiction. I do not believe that is that there is a terribly huge gap between fiction and fan fiction. You're still creating, you can still do the same thing. So stick characters into a scene. So let's say you have these fairly well-formed characters. You could be like, okay, um, oh, character A wakes up at 3 a.m. and smells smoke and wakes up character B, how do they react right out of scene? And through that, you can determine and figure out things like conflict, character dynamics, all that sort of stuff. Um, research. So let's say you have an idea that's based on something in the real world. How do you know if this story hasn't been told yet? And what if fact is actually stranger than fiction? Um, so this is generally step two in my process. I do free writing until I think I have a fairly solid idea of what this story is going to be. I don't have an outline. I don't have anything, but I just have a sense of what the story is. I will generally do research. Um, so research can help ground an idea in the real world, either to create something more realistic, you know, if you're writing contemporary fiction or historical fiction, uh, or to help you craft a new world through speculative fiction. Uh, and what I mean by that is that a lot of speculative fiction takes elements that are real in our world and then expands on them, exaggerates them, makes them absurd, or takes them away and imagines a world without something. Um, I find that research can also provide additional inspiration. Uh, I, this, I, I kept this in here because it's still true, especially because there are library services that are still available around the world. But the library really is your best friend. I wrote most of Anger is a Gift um, in two different libraries in the, the Bay Area. Uh, the majority of it was written in the downtown Oakland branch on 14th and Madison, I think it was. Um, I also did a lot of research and writing uh, in the downtown San Francisco branch of the public library. 
uh, I loved having the information so close so that when I got an idea or when I got stuck writing something, how does this work? How does this procedure work? Uh, I could just go look it up. Um, the other thing is the internet is your best friend. And I want to start by saying that Wikipedia is kind of trash, but it is actually a great place to start and direct what you want to research. I consider it a, sort of like an outline. Like you can go to Wikipedia to look up something. And then from there, especially by looking at the sources at the bottom of the page that are sort uh, sourced throughout, you can find different places to go to find books, interviews, um, any of that sort of stuff. Uh, research also counts as in-person research. Uh, I have interviewed people for every novel that I've ever written. Uh, and it really helped to actually get a personal form of information and that first person account um, uh, to help craft stories. Um, so here's a great example. I use uh, Scrivener. Uh, it is a writing application. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. And part of the reason I love it is because it helps me organize things. So um, the first little screenshot up here, uh, the examples uh, given there is that uh, when I first did research in Scrivener, I would just copy articles. Um, and so each of these is a uh, uh, title of a piece and then the text was in it so that I could go back and, and, and keep it. Um, I changed how I did research, especially because the research for my second, for each of us a desert was so much more intense and so much more detailed. I spent about, oh my God, four months doing research, very, very intense research uh, on this book. Um, because there were so many things that I had not experienced personally that I wanted to write as I was writing this story that touched on things like uh, the migrants trail, immigration, desert wildlife, um, and whatnot. So um, the original title of uh, Each of Us in Desert was El Otro Lado, which means the other side, um, which still actually is a neat title, especially considering what the book has turned out to be. So in this one, each of those folders, you can create multiple folder systems in Scrivener. If you click inside, each one has like very, very complex notes. And I'm going to also give you a screenshot of what those notes look like. So each folder has the title of a book and the author that I read. So those are some of the uh, some of the books. I, I should tell you, I literally could not fit the, the entire research uh, folder in one screenshot. I would say it continues on twice, two more. Like that's about a third of what I did for research. So you have a bunch of um, books, uh, Crossing Over by Ruben Martinez, uh, Coyotes by Ted Conover, The Devil's Highway by Luis <laughs> Alberto Orrea, one of the best, most heartbreaking books ever, ever written. It's so incredible. Uh, Dying to Live, Brother, <laughs> Brother I'm Dying by Edwidge Danticat, which just incredible book. Um, so any, uh, I had those, and then I also have some very general ideas, like indigenous populations, the Colorado River, radiation, migrants. There was this, I had this weird idea that radiation was going to play a part in in the original version of this book. It, it didn't, but I still did research. Uh, so anyway, yeah, um, this is what my notes actually look like. So I just, is, if I have a thought or if I read something and it seems interesting, I write it down. Anything that is bolded meant that I found something that I did not know enough about and I should go research it. Uh, so there were multiple things that I thought I should go research and, and each of those got its own folder as well. I also put whatever page I found something interesting that I thought might play a part in the novel so that I could reference it later. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, there's an interesting one if we look down at number 18. So I re refer to the desert as El Chubacabra because it sucks the water out of you. I thought that was the most brilliant idea in the world. I was like, this is so edgy and cool and it never made it into anything. So sometimes you get ideas and they don't actually go anywhere. And this is what I do with research. So let's talk about one of the biggest ones, which is outlining. So my process is I free write, then I do research and then I outline. So I have a three-step process for how I create something. So I take my idea and I try to determine the many story beats. What I mean by a beat is, uh, let's summarize like, uh, very quickly, how would you summarize like Star Wars and New Hope? Like something basic that everyone knows. And you say, uh, you know, this young farm boy uh, discovers, you know, he's part of this mystical legacy or whatever. Any of this stuff like that. and. That's like an overarching one, but as you actually talk about it, 
this, by the way, this makes it sound like I've never seen Star Wars at all. That I'm just sort of like, I just, I, I could sit here and tell you the story beats of Star Wars A New Hope, but we have other things we need to talk about in this. I'm just not going to do that. But so you were, what are the big points that a story must hit along the way? Don't worry about the details. Don't worry about how a person gets from place to place or, or whatnot. Just focus on the core elements of the story. You can look at things like beat sheets. Uh, my friend Zorita Cordova uses a lot of, um, I think it's Schneider's beat sheet. It's probably a wrong name. Um, movie beat sheets are a popular thing as well. Um, and it's about developing a story, especially if you're looking for a traditional three-act structure where you figure out how does it fit within this pattern. Um, you don't have to write that way. I would say I've tried to use beat sheets, but I tend to write stories that go in very strange routes, especially my second novel has such a a very bizarre structure that I didn't do that at all. Um, so here's the thing though, outlines can always be fleshed out later as you understand your story more, because that's also going to happen. You could do all of this pre-writing and be absolutely certain that you have a story figured out. And then you get down and you start writing it and you're like, oh, this is wrong. This just happened with me with my middle grade debut. Um, I had an extensive outline written. I actually got to do developmental edits with my editor at HarperCollins, Stephanie Stein. and felt very, very confident about this story. And I would say about 85% of what is in the outline made it into the book. But that extra 15% were things I discovered along the way that were, oh, that's the best feeling. And so this is why I understand why some people don't use outlines at all. It is so cool when you figure out the right thing. Um, so th allow yourself the freedom to do that too. So some writers do the other steps before assembling a full outline. For me, the outline is the last step. If I have an outline that I feel confident on, then I start writing. So this is uh, the original uh, outline for Anger is a Gift. Um, and so what I did is it, the book is split into chapters. So uh, initially, the initial version of the story uh, was going to be multi-point of view, uh, whereas multiple characters, um, third-person narration. So if you notice here in uh, parentheses is whose chapter that was. Um, Wow, so much of this does not, is not actually what made it into the final version. But there is, you can sort of see if you read this and you've read it, there's a gift, the sort of skeleton, the bones of what will become a different story, which is that the opening scene is always going to happen, have something to do with Bart, and it involves the train being stopped, and it involves an interaction between Moss and Esperanza, things that made it into the final version. Um, there were still metal detectors in this version. They were different though. Um, yeah, so this is what an outline looks like. It is not every detail, but it's things like, you know, his Bart train is stopped because of, uh, oh, see, I hadn't even put the character's name in at this point. Um, oh God, I forgot about that character. This is interesting reading this because there's, excuse me, um, uh, characters who never made it into other drafts. Yeah, so you can see some of it's detailed, some of it's not so detailed. It's just the sense of, do I know what's happening in this chapter or this part of the story? So my outline for book number two, Each of Us a Desert, is much different. I knew fairly early on that the structure would be weird. And then through uh, edits with my editor after I turned in the first draft, um, we ca came up with the most absurd, ambitious idea for how this story would be structured. And the idea for it came over French pastries as we were going over editorial stuff here in New York. Um, and I just, I remember looking at my editor, Miriam Weinberg at Tortine and being like, hey, what if the whole book is a prayer? Part of Miriam's editorial feedback was that the religion that I had created was not full enough. It needed more detail, which is interestingly an advice that I had gotten from another writer friend that it just didn't feel fleshed out. So I was like, well, let's really flesh it out and let's make the whole book one prayer. And it, she just looked at me and she was like, that's ridiculous. You have to do, you have to do that. You have to, do, it's, it's so smart. So I knew that this would have no chapters because there's no chapters in a prayer, but I knew I had to figure out a way to break up the story. So my working outline for this book was so much different than anything I've ever written. I had these things called interstitials in which uh, the text is in first and second person because the character says you, and they're referring to the God, but the way it reads, there's sort of this line between referring to the God and referring to the reader. So it breaks the fourth wall. Um, and so I have multiple of them throughout. And then any of the numbered parts were 
stories as this character relates it uh, to their God. Um, and so I, this outline, I would say my anger outline was about three or 4,000 words, which is pretty long. My, it was twice as long for this book because it had way more pieces and more things to figure out. And the thing with the outlines that really helped is it gave me a sort of bird's eye view of what the book looked like. So that I had a sense of what does this arc look like? How long does it last? What do the three acts look like? Because there are th three very distinct parts of this book. So anyway, so once you think you have your story, whatever you have done for your pre-writing, how do you actually write it? So what kind of story is it? Determine, and sometimes you don't know this at the beginning, but usually as you're working through your process, you'll figure it out. Or you could be going into it where you've taken an idea and you're like, I'm just, this is a short story idea, I know. But let's say you don't. So determine whether you're, you're whether it is a short fiction or a novel, a manuscript or a screenplay. Often you'll know what it is before you start it, but sometimes you don't. So how can you tell? Um, I quote my friend, Danielle Clayton again, um, uh, who said that she writes a story uh, a short story answers a single question, just one concern, one issue, one conflict. The length of a story and the complicated nature of it often dictate which type it is. If you were trying to write a short story and you were branching off on all of these things, it might be so rich of an idea that you actually need to make it a novel. Um, there is a value though, and there is a lot of fun. I've I have a, sh a short story coming out in Vampires Never Get Old, edited by my friends Zoretta Cordova and Natalie C. Parker, in which I really feel like I could turn it into a novel, but I, I loved limiting the scope, limiting the scope of the story so that you only just get a taste of it. Um, and then find your process. Uh, are you a pantser or a gardener? I'm going to explain what these ter two terms are. A pantser or a gardener. Uh, I'm pretty sure I spelled gardener wrong there. Uh, there's missing an E. Uh, this is someone who only knows a few key points and is otherwise writing by the seat of their pants or playing in the garden that they've constructed. Uh, pants or a plotter are really common. Uh, George R. R. Martin talks about being a gardener or an architect. He is a gardener, for example. So they very rarely write very rarely writes with an outline and instead just sees where the writing takes them. Um, they, I've had, heard people described as, imagine it's a long drive on the highway and they know where this rest stop is, they know where this hotel they're gonna stay at and then they know their final destination. And so that's all they know, but then they just write to discover what's in between. Um, are you a plotter or an architect? So stories are heavily planned prior to writing, usually detailed outlines. And I find that plotters and architects must know the ending before they write anything. That's me. I'm absolutely a plotter. I'm absolutely an architect. I do not write, uh, true, I do not write a word of a manuscript until I know the ending. Not a word of any short story. Any, I got to know what the ending is. Uh, I want to know what I'm writing towards. I want to know what the fulfilling or non-fulfilling thing that happens at the end. Um, are you both? I know people who are both, who plot things somewhat, much more than a pants or a gardener, but then still leave themselves leeway to sort of have fun. So here's the thing, allow yourself to try different techniques to find the one that works best for you. There is no correct way and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Your process is yours and it's gonna work for you. I find that even though I have a fairly solid process, which is free writing, research, outline, then I start writing, sometimes life throws a wrench in your plans like a pandemic. Um, other times I find that I don't need a certain step. I didn't do a whole lot of research for The Insiders, my middle grade book. Very, very little actually. Um, I think part of it is because it's contemporary, but also I'm not really veering out into things I don't understand. So I didn't have that as much of a desire to do research. I did a little and my research was reading other middle grade books. Um, that counts as research, by the way. Reading, if you want to write horror, if you want to write science fiction, if you want to write middle grade science fiction, young adult horror, any of those things, research is reading uh, people in the same genre who are trying to do the same thing as you, even if they're telling a completely different story. So most of my research was actually just reading other middle grade books. Anyway, write, 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 write. Why aren't you writing now? Actually, you might be writing right now. Write. Figure out your process. It can take time. It could take years. That's okay. Because all the while you're still creating, you're still using the creative part of your brain. Um, so just a little more in, uh, of an insight into how I actually compose my story. Uh, I use Scrivener to write all my drafts. 
And so I split up books by chapter and scene and stick each one in its own folder like this. So the original anger draft, as you can see, it has the chapter number and then in parentheses was the name of the character it belonged to. Um, and then within that, uh, you have uh, the text of each chapter. I like this because it doesn't feel as wieldy as a Google Doc or a Microsoft Word where you have to contend with the whole thing that you've written. Anytime I'm in one of these documents, it's just that scene or just that chapter. Um, so the fairly most recent draft of Each of Us a Desert, um, you can see the interstitials that I mentioned. Um, and then this book is so strange because not only is it first person, with second person interstitials, um, but there are also seven, no, six short stories within the book itself. It's a very weird book, I'm very excited about it. Um, and so as you can see here, that is um, how I have it so that I could see, just looking at that, I could see, okay, an interstitial, four scenes, interstitial, and then a story. I wanted things, this was great for pacing that I didn't go so long without one of these interstitials or one of these short stories that the reader forgot that this book was weird and that this book had this strange format. I wanted things to flow very well. Um, also, side little thing that helped, I use the icons in Scrivener. Um, when I finished a draft or I finished editing a chapter, I put a green flag so that anytime I open it, I'm like, look, Mark, you got this done. That is a good thing. Feel good about what you finished. So anyway, finish your project. I, this is so important, and I actually recommend to a lot of young writers that you start with short stories because one of the hardest things is starting a story and then just finishing it, no matter what the length is. I mean, that's especially hard if you're writing your first novel because you just, you know, not saying it always happens with everyone, but for a lot of young writers, they struggle so much with this idea that it's going to take forever. I'm never going to finish it. It's going to be terrible. Um, so I say start with short stories. Start with the thing where you can have a beginning, middle, end in 4,000 words, and it's done. Get used to that feeling of finishing something and being done with it. And then try something longer. Try a 10,000-word short story. Try a novella. Try a novelette. Try anything that you can do to get used to this feeling that you can finish the thing that you start. So go off. Finish your project. Finish it. It's very important. It doesn't matter if you do all this pre-writing and all this preparation to figure out your process if you're not actually finishing the thing that you're starting. So finish it. Commit to it. It's okay if you jump from project to project if you feel like you're getting stuck. I do that all the time. So anyway, thank you. We did this. I have no sense of how long this is, by the way. I hope it is <laughs> a good length. Anyway, um, what I hope is that this provides an inspiration, that you can watch this lecture you can get not only ideas but get ideas about process itself a lot of us writers one of our favorite things to do sometimes when we sit together is talk about craft how do we do the things that we do why do we make the choices that we make it is through a lot of this pre-writing that i figure out things um for example and we i could do a whole lecture just on the concept of voice and how you figure out how a story is told i often figure out voice in my outlines. Um, in particular, for each of us, a desert and the insiders, the voice came out through the outline because I realized the story needed to be told a certain way and the characters sounded a certain way. Uh, I definitely find voices easier to write in first person than third person. Um, but at the same time, you, I think third person stories can be very voicey and can have this sense of identity and character within them. So here's what I hope. Whatever your process happens to be, whatever it is that you do, I hope that you can figure it out. And this is something that I wish I had in high school. And that, like, but that's not to like criticize my, my my teachers or anything who actually helped wonderfully and, and helped inspire me to be creative. And I think how indebted I am to them. But I think it's just a an element of writing that a lot of people don't talk about. What is the actual process that you do to make this happen? So um I hope you have inspiration from that. I hope it provides you with a framework and with things that seem interesting to you so that you can get them done. I'm gonna take a drink because I've been yapping for like an hour. Anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you again, Words Alive. You can find that at wordsalive.org um, for helping make this a reality. I'm so glad I actually got to sit down and talk this out and present this to all of you. I'm so thankful for you uh, and trust. <laughs> When we get through this, and I think we will get through this, uh, I can't wait to come back and visit your kids. It's a delight. 
so thank you for listening. Uh, you can find me as Mark Does Stuff uh, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, whatever social media. I go by the same handle everywhere. That's M A R K D O E S S T U F F. Um, I you can find my website is Mark Oshiro O S H I R O dot com. That is where you can find information on my books, uh, events, when I happen to ha get back out into touring or whatnot, um, as well as you can find um, the pre-order campaign for Each of Us a Desert if you're watching this video before the 15th of uh, uh, September 2020. Um, and then I write book reviews at markreads.net and TV reviews at markwatches.net. Um, thank you for watching, and I really, really hope this helps you become a better writer. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.